우리 저 맨체스터 유나이티드 거기랑 웨인룬이랑 무슨 협상하는 과정 <웃음> 아 맞아 그때 말했던 것 같은데. 이게 너네 뭐 하는? 너네 뭐 하는? 우리 슈퍼를 하려고 했는데 자료 없어. 뭐 한다고? 슈퍼 볼. 슈퍼 볼. 슈퍼. 아 지난번 했던 거. 그거 미국 미스 슈퍼 관련된 거. 가수랑 기억. 아야 그거에 그거 미국그랑 쿠바 사태 옛날에 했던 거잖아. 소련이랑. 그게 잘 맞아. 그런 거 아예 스포츠 매거진 같은 데 가서 기사 한세 개만 찾아도 다 나오던데 기사 만 나와 기사 어, 기사만 그러니까. 나와서 그, 그, 그 기사에서 그... 발전시켜서 하는 게 기사에 뭐 누가 뭘 요구했다 그런 거지 근데 막 필요한 거 하면 기사는 거의 안 쓰잖아 저는 너무... 기사 못하고 okay, so then, uh, so uh, well, let's, continue, let's continue with the class You can discuss at the break time or the, more at the end of the class, right? So the last time we talked about uh, Getting to know the other side, how to make conversation, and the source of power. Knowing the other side's batna would be a source of power. Trying to strengthen your batna and weaken the other side's batna, like a strategy. Okay. So we discussed about how to strengthen your batna, how to weaken your other side's batna. We talked about the Zopa strategy. We're going to talk a little bit, a little bit like anchoring. We're going to talk about today. Try to make the other person think the Zopa is here and not here. Okay. Uh, so we need to do some homework to help us to do that. We said to set an ambitious target. Usually helps. Okay. If we know the other side's best no deal option, we can make an ambitious target close to their no no deal option. So we're going to talk about psychological tools and traps. So first of all, don't assume that you are negotiating over a fixed pie. Second, use anchoring. So we'll talk about each of these in turns. Third, avoid overconfidence. Four, use framing. Five, look at more detailed information. Six, look at the negotiation from everyone's perspective. Encourage reciprocity. Reciprocity means you give something, I give something back. Use contrast. And look at the big picture. So the most important one of this is going to be anchoring. Right? So first of all, uh, human decision making. How do humans make decisions? We have two paths. Prescriptive, they try to prescribe how human beings should make decisions. So we studied about decision tree. Right? Decision tree is a good way to make decision. Look at all the facts and make a decision tree and decide. Descriptive research looks at behavioral ways. Behavioral ways that we make decisions. For example, heuristics, also called rules of thumb. So here is a way, a heuristic way of decision making. Your company has decided that it's only going to recruit at the top 10 business schools. Do you understand this thing? Sentence? Okay. So that's a heuristic, that's a rule of thumb. Is that scientific way to make a decision? <coughs> Might be scientific? No? So uh, if you have to criticize the use of this heuristic, what would your criticism be? And if you have to defend, if you think, yes, that's a good idea, what would your defense be? So discuss with your partner. Find the criticism of this policy of the company and find some defense of the policy of the company. Do you understand the question? Yes. So in the US, let's say, only recruit from Harvard and Yale, okay, and MIT. They call the Ivy League schools in the US, Princeton. Okay, our company, we're a top financial company in Wall Street, we make this policy. Okay, what's the criticism of the policy? What's the advantage of the policy? Are you looking up heuristic in the dictionary? Uh, heuristic we also call rule of thumb. When people are doing the construction, 
Sometimes they don't use the ruler because it takes too much time, right? Instead, they just use their thumb. Okay? They do the things using the thumb or the hand, right? Measuring by the hand. Okay? Does the desk fit over there? I can get the ruler and measure exactly, or I can just use my feet, right? Like this way. Do you understand? Check. It's not the exact. So heuristic means just. We're not doing things exactly, or so exactly scientifically, right? It's just some rule that we make, not a scientific rule. We're doing things, okay? So I'll discuss. So we're going to do some discussion today, so can you sit next to him over here? Hmm? Okay, then you discuss there and I'll discuss there. Don't like girls? Okay, so what do you think? What is the criticism? Who can give me a criticism of this policy? There is a lot of uh, if proof that uh, if someone doesn't do that uh, studying a business course, but there is a lot of uh, good, good business person. So. Right, so we might miss out on a group the best candidates. Maybe they didn't study at Harvard or Yale, but they might be the best person for the job because of other reasons. Okay? What is the defense? Who can try to defend this? What would you say to defend this policy? Interesting is the most research, research results. So, um, the top 10 business course uh, graduate student is the, so something special to study or another lasting special some different or other So just generally the top ten the students in the top ten business school here it's like you have some minimum minimum level, right? Do you understand? You can be sure you're not going to get lower than a minimum level. They already worked hard to get to the business school. Right? So you said here, you might miss the very best candidates. There are a lot of talented people who don't attend the top 10 schools for a variety of reasons, right? Some of them might have the experience, which is the perfect fit for your company, but we miss them because we only hired from the top 10, right? So we can see this debate on Wall Street, but these days, 
in the old days it used to be more that they would hire from the top business schools, but nowadays on Wall Street, they're thinking more about the experience of the candidates, okay? Because this, I guess one reason is these days we have the internet, so they can find a background check on people more easily, right? So they say they prefer to see people who is actually interested in that area. So for example, you want to work for the investment bank, you made your own website about investments, okay? Then the, they can see that you're interested in investments, and then they are not as worried about which business school you went to, or if you got the A plus grade or not, right? They think they're starting to think that your outside activities, right, in your life or your experiences, can give them a better idea about the good candidates. Recently in the UK, Ernst & Young, which is a famous accountancy company, they took away their requirement that their applicants have, even have a university degree. So they even went as far as saying that, we are going to start hiring people. They used to have, minimum you have to have a degree from the university. But they even said, we're going to start hiring people. We might hire people who don't have a degree. Right? It's possible. If they have the right experiences and in their life, and they're the right fit for the company. Then the second one is the cost of visiting more than 10 campuses. So, it's a cost, right? It's the same, it's like costing time and money. It's quicker for me to do with my feet rather than use the measuring tape. So instead of making all the efforts to find the right candidate, it's quicker for us just to make, use this heuristic. Do you understand? And, and the point is we have some minimum. We know that the candidate is going to be above the minimum minimum uh, thing, right? Like pre-screening. So the school has already pre-screened the candidate. <clears throat> so uh, we have to think about these, we can fall into these kind of traps that we, we mentioned here. Uh, there's a guy called Charlie Munger, he's a partner of uh, Warren Buffet in the investment company, so he's a billionaire. Whenever he has a fi difficult financial di decision, he put, pulls a checklist out of his pocket. He goes through the list to make sure he doesn't fall into any trap. So these traps we're going to talk about, right? These are psycholo do you understand? psychological traps that people have, like bias in their mind. Okay, so this guy, every time he has a decision, he pulls out this list to check. I'm not falling into this psychological trap. The first one is the mythical fixed pie. We automatically assume that our interests are in conflict with the interests of the other side. So we did the experiment before in the class of the arm wrestle. Can you remember the arm wrestle? Yes. I asked you to, who see, who can get the most points? You get one point if your hand touches the table. Okay? So you immediately assumed that you're in conflict with the other person. Why did you assume that you were in conflict? Why did you make conflict? Yeah, but why did you want to conflict against the other person? You just do you understand assume? Yes. You just assume that you have to fight against them. Well, you didn't. If you just did together, you could have made a lot of points. You made more points than she made more points. Okay, but well, you just want to beat her, right? Do you understand some psychological bias that people have? Well, maybe men are more competitive too. They want to win or do better, but they don't. They, if they do that, they can miss the point that instead of you showing that you're better than him, you could both have got a good, a good, better result. Okay, so we can miss out on that kind of thing. Do you understand that problem, psychological problem? Do you think you make that kind of problem usually hmm? with other people? You immediately think I need to fight against them or be in conflict instead of cooperating, right? Maybe the relative grading in the class, right? You might think, I'm not going to help them because they might get a better grade. And she might think, I'm not going to help her, she might get a better grade, right? So you think you have to be in conflict, but then if you help each other, you understand better and you both get a better grade in the end, right? So, also we have another one called reactive evaluation. 
Because we think the other side is competing against us, we devalue their proposal. Sometimes we don't even consider their proposal. We think they're only making the proposal because they're weak. So we don't listen. So for example, uh, you make a proposal to me, very re reasonable and rational proposal. But I think, oh, she's only making that proposal because she has some weakness on her side. So I just ignore, don't listen to your proposal, right? So let's look at an, an example of this. So do you know the Cold War? Oh, yes. During the Cold War, a researcher took a proposal to reduce the arms to a group of American subjects. And he said, this is a proposal from President Gorbachev of Russia. Okay, what do you think? These subjects who were all American said, that's a bad proposal. Okay? Then they took the same, exactly the same proposal to some more Americans. And they said, this proposal is from President Reagan, President of the US. What did they say? Good proposal or bad proposal? Exactly the same proposal. <coughs> This time they changed, they said it's a good proposal. Do you understand? So because the proposal came from the other side, they thought they were thinking, we're in conflict. So their proposal is bad proposal, I don't agree. Right? But the other side, they think, oh that's from the US, that's a good proposal. Okay? And so people do that naturally. So I remember when I was a student, one time in the house, one guy who was living with us, who was quite silly, and we didn't like, he came home, and he made some story like, the US never landed on the moon, right? It was all uh, made in Hollywood, right? So we said to him, oh, you're, that's really silly, how can you say that, right? And then a, a few weeks later, one of my friends is studying aeronautical engineering, very smart. He said, I think it could be that the U.S. landing was filmed in Hollywood, and they didn't land on the moon. Everybody said, oh yes, you're right, could be, could be right. Do you understand that idea? So people's psychology, if they think they're in conflict against somebody, they don't like somebody, or they're in conflict, and they make a proposal, they say, no, let's, don't listen. So you have to avoid that, that problem, right? You have to listen to the other side, and listen to their proposal, and respect their proposal. Okay? Don't think it's just a uh, weakness. Consider properly. Do you do this kind of thing? Sometimes? I used to do it before. You do? Yes. So anchoring then is more important than one we're going to talk about. Especially for price. Do you understand anchor? So here's an anchor. Anchor looks like this. The ship. The ship used the anchor. It's a very big anchor, so it doesn't move. Okay? So anchoring means we stay in this place, don't move on either side. If you look in the dictionary, you're just going to find this, right? Anchoring is just has a different meaning for a negotiation. We anchor on an initial value. So we stay around this value, we stay close to this value. When we are talking about the price for uncertain things, we tend to, somebody says the price first, we tend to stay close to that price. So let's do a test. So think of the last three digits of your phone number and add 400 to them. Write it down. You're not going to need a calculator, right? You should be able to do that yourself. So the last three digits of your phone number, right? Add 400 to the last three digits of your phone number. Write down the number on the page. So if your number is 123, number is going to be plus 400, it's going to be 523, okay? So add 400 to the last three digits of your phone number. Okay. Have you ever heard of Attila the Hun? Attila the Hun? You never heard of Attila the Hun? Famous conqueror? Maybe in Korean Let's see. Who 
훈죽 권하고 훈족 훈족 훈훈 앤. 조기스터 패밀리. 예, 훈족. Do you, do you know the 훈족? Yes. Yeah, so what year did the 훈족 attack Europe? Oh, German. Attila, Attila. They invaded Europe, right? Yes. So he was one of the most feared, feared conquerors of world history. Okay. So was he defeated? He was eventually defeated. He invaded Europe, but he didn't get all the way to Rome. He only got as far as Austria and uh, France, right? So he was defeated. Was he defeated before or after the number you wrote? What do you think? Just guess. Yes, guess. Before. Write down. Before or after. Just write down. Before your number or after your number? Okay. Uh, guess. What do you think? Don't check on Google. <laughs> yes. Right. <coughs> then, after you guess, then write down the year. Now write down the year. Have a guess of the year. Close. 
Anchor means staying in the same. You start with an anchor. So this was your anchor. Where, where is your number? 958 was your anchor. Right? So this was your anchor. You were here. Okay? And then you just moved to, to 1200. Close to your anchor. 200 away from your anchor. Okay? So this person had an anchor of 697. They moved just 200. Two. But to 500. Because they use this number as an anchor. Do you understand? So you're using this number as an anchor. So if, you, if this was your number, you probably wouldn't have said this. You would have said 700 or 800 or 900. Right? Does that make sense? No, because this is just a random number that you made from your phone. Numbers. Right? So you do anchoring. Cause. Proven. Anchoring is a problem. You said, so until the of 450. Yes, that's right. You knew the answer? Before? He guessed. I think maybe 320. Ah, that's why, because you knew the answer, so that's why the anchoring didn't affect you. Do you like history? Huh? Yeah. Yes? So if you meet somebody, should you talk about history? If you meet a business person, should you talk about history or don't talk about history? No, don't talk about history. Don't talk about history, right? You're going to be too excited and talking too much about those things. So 451. It's not important. The important thing was we did the experiment. So it's the same for everybody. You're not alone. They did other research on this. Everybody does the same thing. Everybody does anchoring. Okay? Fixing around some number. So now answer this question with your partner. So when you're negotiating with me, do you want me to throw out the first price or do you want to throw out the first price? Who do you want to say the first price when we're negotiating? Uh, I want to so that, discuss with your partner. What if we're selling a car? Okay. You're negotiating with me about selling a car. Do you want to say the price first or, or should I say the price first? Okay, hands up two sides. Do you want to try out the first price? Hands up the other person. Why do you want to try out the first price? Because we throw, uh, we choose the first price and we anchoring the this surround the this price. Okay. So we want best alternative price. Okay, people might anchor around that price. So conventional wisdom says always let the other person try out the first price. That's conventional wisdom, right? But anchoring says you should try out the first price and try to anchor the other side to your number. Okay? So to sum up, we should follow conventional wisdom when we are dealing with the sale of something where the value is uncertain. So, do you know uh, Thomas Edison? Uh, yes. Right? He created some new machinery for the stock market, for using it in the stock market. And he had no idea about the value of this. Okay? So he thought, I'm going to ask for $5,000. Okay? So he went to negotiate with the person in Wall Street who he was selling the equipment to. And he let the other person say the price first. The other person said $30,000. Okay? So was Edison right or not right to say the first price? So he was right not to say the first price, right? If he had said $5,000, the other guy would have said yes immediately. Okay? But the other guy, he let the other guy say the first price, so the other guy said 30000 Okay? So if we're uncertain about the value, it may be that we can let, we're not sure, we might let them say the other price first. Right? But most of the time, we're more certain about the value, we're confident about the value, like the car, selling the car, then we're going to try to say the first price and try to anchor the other side to your price. So we saw the condo, right? 
So the condo, I'm going to say the price first and try and anchor you at 800,000 up here, not down here. At seven, you might say 750. Then we might start to get anchored around 750. Okay, but I want to say that 800. So here is a quote from Henry Kissinger. Uh, if agreement is usually found between two starting points, there is no point in making moderate offers. Right, so there's no point in making a moderate offer saying 770 is fair for the condo or 780, right? So a good bargaining technique would suggest a point of extreme. You understand extreme? Far more extreme than the other person is willing to accept. The more outrageous the initial proposal, the better is the prospect that one, what, what one really wants will be considered as a compromise. So this is talking about the stretch goal, right? So the further we go here, then it means in the end we'll end up here. Okay? If we just start here, we'll end up back here. So he's saying the further, the further we go, the better the compromise we can get in the end. Okay? It will be anchored maybe up to here. So <clears throat> the only problem is if we make a very unrealistic proposal, then it's not effective. It's not going to be an anchor. We want to make this as an anchor. Do you understand? But it's not, if we make a ridiculous proposal, they don't see that as an anchor. Right? You can lose credibility and look unreasonable. Okay? So you have to have a reason why you're putting the price out here. So you have to justify. Do you understand justify? Justify means make a reason for your proposal. You have to help your counterpart explain to themselves, their boss, their friends, or their spouse, wife or husband, why the price was accepted was fair and reasonable. They don't want to go home to their friends or their wife and say, oh, I only got this much for the car, right? I got a very low price. And then the wife's going, why, why did you get the car? I have a favorite thing. Right? They want to say, to they would explain, no, no, wait, wait, wait. There's a good reason, right? The reason is the car is very old and blah, blah, blah. So you have to give them the reason, right? Do you understand? They need a reason. They, they have to have a reason for... They can explain to themselves and explain to the other people why they should accept your price or your proposal. Okay? So, it's not... The point is, it's not a outrageous. Do you understand outrageous? Or unbelievable. You make an aggressive proposal, but you should have a reason. So, in the condo example, you would try reason, you would compare the sales, right? You'd look at the price appreciation. So you would say, in the past year, the price went up 10%. So next year, the price will go up 10% too, okay? So you can make a profit. If you buy now, you can get a 10% appreciation next year, okay? So then I go home to my wife, she says, oh, that's very expensive for the apartment. And I say, oh, but you don't understand, it's going to appreciate 10%. <laughs> So I can sell it for a higher price, and then she'll say, oh, okay. Do you understand? Yes. Give me the reason, right? Say, you made some improvements to the condo. I made some improvements. Uh, the rental rate, you can get a very good rent. You understand rent, okay? The, re the rental income can cover the mortgage payment, okay? Condos are selling very quickly. A lot of people are buying the condos. So you have to give them reasons why you should, you're saying this high price or aggressive price. Okay, you need to be extreme but flexible. Look at the difference between these two offers. Right, both of them are aggressive offers. We'll pay you 11 million for your company. Very low and aggressive offer. Okay, we don't want people to think that's not reasonable. Okay, or outrageous. So we're a little bit flexible. Instead we say, we understand from what you've described in our conversations, there is some hidden value we can't see in the company. So we haven't been able to evaluate the company's value exactly. So now we're offering you 11 million, okay? Based on what we know today. But we're open in the future to talk about another price. But do you understand what we've done? We've anchored. We've put out the number 11 million. So we're trying to anchor around 11 million, but we're not being Unreasonable. Do you understand unreasonable? Yes. Are you unreasonable? Very unreasonable? No, right? We don't look very unreasonable. You said this in a reasonable way, but we've 
still don't are accurate. We put out the number, and we hope that we'll start to talk about around 11 million. Okay? If we just say like this, they might say, oh, you're ridiculous, you're crazy. I'm not anchor. And they wouldn't think about that as an anchor. Okay? But now we say this way, they might think about it as an anchor. Yes, he seems like reasonable. Okay? So the last uh, question before the break time. Uh, what do you do when there's a stalemate and neither side wants to say the first price? So I'll discuss with your partner. Neither side wants to say the first price. Stalemate is in check, is in chess. Do you play chess? Yes. Nobody can win. There's a situation in chess where nobody can win. Yes. If you play chess, you know about that. Okay? So, like, the king can't move, right? And you can't take the king, but the king can't move. That's stalemate. So, stalemate means in English that no way to move forward. Okay? So, neither side is saying the first price. What are you going to do? Discuss with your partner. You don't want to say the first price because you're very uncertain. Like this one, right? You're very uncertain. You don't want to say the first price. You're Thomas Edison. But then the guy from Wall Street doesn't want to say the first price either. So nobody is saying the first price. So what should you do then in that case? Like this case, Thomas Edison in Wall Street. We don't know the value. I made a new invention. I'm selling it to Wall Street. We have no idea of the value. Nobody wants to say the first price. What are we going to relevant facts to the value. Okay? Lawyers or attorneys often use this when they're negotiating. Okay? We exchange information. For example, the lawyers talk about the similar case. Last week there was a case like this and they got this much money. Okay? So neither side is putting out an offer. We're not making an offer, but eventually we're able to make a consensus. So here are some examples. You apply for the job, you say well, people with my qualifications, they usually get this salary. Okay? My former colleague received this salary. Or you want a bonus. You, you say, bonuses last year were 50%, but I know this year was not as good as last year. Okay? So you just compare it to the other situation. If you don't want to put out the first price, you can compare it to... You don't want to make the first offer, right? I'll give you this. You, just, you can just compare the facts. And eventually, uh, you can come to the consensus. So then let's take a break there, and then we'll do some negotiation after the break.